Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started with the class. So for announcements, homework three is due this Wednesday. So take a look at that uh, assignment coming up. Um, let me know if you have any questions during office hours today. Exam one, uh, it will be this coming Friday. It will be issued this Friday due on Monday. It's basically take home. You will uh, download the exam, work it on your own. You have to work it on your own. Don't talk to anybody about it. And then uh, submit via Canvas. And so I will post uh, some more information about that uh, in a Canvas announcement. All right, so last time we finished up talking about electronic test equipment. And I hope that even if you had some, well, whether or not you had experience with test equipment, um, if, if you didn't have any experience, I hope that got you caught up to speed. And if you did have some experience, I, I hope that taught you some new features and maybe new approaches to go into the lab and, and make some efficient measurements. Um, next, we're going to move on to talking about power sources like batteries, solar panels, things like that, um, and control of power sources like you're doing in lab with pulse, with modulating uh, motor power to control motor speed. And just in general, turning current on and off to loads so that you can electronically control loads like motors and actuators and solenoids and, and heaters and things like that. So, so I hope uh, you get something out of this section of the course talking about the sources and, and control. And I got into, I guess more interested in, in batteries and different battery chemistries and battery capacity and capability uh, when, I, when I started uh, uh, operating radios through amateur radio uh, uh, off-grid um, during an event called Field Day. I started that seriously maybe about 12, 13 years ago where you have to go off-grid and operate on emergency power solar panels and, and batteries and, and also camping off-grid. Like how long, how long is your battery going to last to give you power while you're off grid. Um, so I got more interested in that. And, and I, I think that if you're operating anything that's not connected to a, a power source like the AC power grid, this is useful. Any kind of mobile application, um, any kind of um, you know high altitude balloons, things like that, where sensors have to operate uh, not connected to the power grid. So I think this will apply. And even if you're connected to the power grid, I think this applies because you can control power from AC power sources, uh, maybe converted to DC first using these techniques and these circuits. Okay, so let's talk about what we're talking about today. So electronic systems, they require a power source. Every, every practical circuit that I can think of, useful circuit, uh, requires some kind of power source to perform the intended purpose. Uh, so that's that's what this is, the power source here. Power conversion, when I talk about power, so we're going to talk about power conversion. That is um, converting voltages from the source to voltages that can be used by circuits or subsystems within your overall system. And power control uh, enables, disables, and applies variable power, variable voltage maybe to, to the loads. So when we're talking about power sources, we're gonna concentrate on batteries, both uh, primary batteries and rechargeable batteries. We're gonna talk a little bit about solar so that you can charge when you're not near, near an AC power source. Uh, we're gonna talk about converting voltages for, for circuits that need voltages different than that of the power source. You know, for example, while well, you're doing it in lab, you have a, um, a, a battery pack that is six volts nominally, and then your motor requires 1.5 volts. So you're already using a DC to DC converter board. Um, that's under the class of circuits called switching converters. We're gonna dig into that to see how they work. Um, and then there are also linear regulators. We'll talk about linear regulators. Linear regulators um, are less complex, but less power efficient in some applications. So we'll, we'll, we will dig into that. And then for controlling power, when you think of controlling power, you could just think of a switch, right? A light switch on the wall controls power. Um, oftentimes, uh, 
switches contain some kind of actuator or arm that either um, contacts a cam or contacts some some physical object, and so you can turn things on and off with a with a mechanical switch. Uh, we're going to talk about electronic control. Um, you're using a MOSFET, a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor in, in lab. So we're concentrating on that in lab. Uh, we'll talk about that. But we're also going to look at, at relays. So relays are uh, electromechanical control, basically opening and closing a switch using an electromagnet. So we'll talk about that. So let's start off talking about uh, uh, batteries. So, um, so typical battery purposes. So why do you use a battery? Just plug into the wall all the time, right? Plug into the AC power grid. Well, if you want to operate um, a portable system or you want to operate away from primary power sources, then that's what you use typically uh, batteries for. So if you have a drone, you're not gonna have a power cable going to a drone typically. Um, if you're using your, your laptop not connected to the wall, you're, you're using batteries. And you're often interested in uh, the electrical characteristics, like the life of the battery, how long it's going to be able to provide the required power to your device, um, but also the mechanical considerations, right? So how, how uh, heavy is the battery? Because in either of these applications, you need so much energy stored for a certain amount of time of operation. We'll talk about that. And your drone, you don't want to eat up all the payload uh, of the payload capacity of the drone using the battery. So, you know, battery weight is important. You don't want to lug around a 20 pound laptop. Uh, so um, physical mechanical considerations are important. But also other than portable devices, batteries provide continuity of power. When, when power goes intermittent, meaning off, right? So you can buy batteries to power um, your computer, a UPS, an uninter uninterrupted power source uh, uh, is, is a basically a battery system that provides AC power through an inverter. We'll talk about that. Uh, so that your computer doesn't shut down when the power, when a power glitch happens. Um, and you can in fact power your whole house. You could store up energy from solar or from the grid and power your whole house with batteries uh, nowadays. So battery topics are really useful across engineering disciplines. And so we're gonna talk about these topics like common specifications for batteries, right? So if you're choosing a battery for a project, what do you care about? Like we know voltage, right? We know we need a certain voltage, but, but what else do we care about? And we can relate that to the chemistries of, of different batteries. So when someone talks about a, 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 a lithium ion battery versus a, a lithium iron phosphate battery, right? What, what's, what's the difference there? We'll talk about the mechanical design considerations like the density of energy compared to, or the, the energy compared to uh, weight, energy compared to volume. Um, and then we'll talk about capacity and battery life examples and and then we'll talk about rechargeable batteries. So I'm going to use uh, a double A battery, double A batteries in, in many examples, because they're a very common battery, very common cell. And you can get data. I was able to get data sheets on these so I can show you the concepts and show you some examples. But remember that as we go through these battery examples using double A's, uh, these, these concepts, these calculations, these approaches apply to other battery types. So let's talk about battery basics, right? So this is the schematic symbol often for a battery. Um, batteries convert stored chemical energy into electrical energy. They cause charge to move. Okay, and that's, that's what you want. To, they have a voltage across them. They cause charge to move. That means you're delivering energy uh, that's stored in a chemical means uh, to an external circuit. So a cell, a single cell is, is created using two dissimilar metals and an electrolyte. And the cell voltage depends on the chemistry of the battery, meaning the chemistry of the electrodes. Uh, 
and the chemistry of the electrolyte. And if you take one or more cells, put them together, then you formed actually a battery, a battery of cells. So often we, we even for single cell batteries, I <laughs> see I did it right there. Even for single cells, we call them batteries, right? But multiple cells together form, uh, form the battery. So up here, you could, you could consider this, uh, you know, a single cell battery. This could be a multi-cell battery. I've seen them used interchangeably. I don't think people are strictly uh, showing the number of cells in their battery, but those indicate batteries as, uh, as voltage sources typically. Okay, so let's look at a single cell AA alkaline battery. This is often called a 1.5 volt cell. So this is a good example of a, of a single cell battery. Um, it has uh, uh, two electrodes and an electrolyte that gives you nominally 1.5 volts. We'll talk about that, that varies. This is a good example of a multiple cell or multi-cell battery. This is a lead acid battery like you'd have in, in your car. So, you know, we, we consider this a single battery. It's actually uh, composed of six lead acid cells and each cell is 2.1 volts. So, so nominally you have 12.6 uh, volts at a full charge for this battery. Even though it's commonly called called a 12 volt battery, 12.6 12 volts is typical for a full charged battery, and 13.6 uh, or higher is considered a charging voltage for this battery. Okay, so each cell has an anode and a cathode, and um, so if you want to remember uh, which side of a device is the anode. Uh, um, an anode is the electrode through which conventional current or positive charge flow enters the device. And you can remember that using this, um, this acronym ACID, right? You can remember that for battery acid, anode current into the device. So the anode is where you have positive charge flow into the device. Okay, so for this battery, this 1.5 volt battery, the anode, uh, when this battery is supplying current, the anode is on the left because the current enters and the current leaves on the right. That's the cathode, okay? which is a little weird because when you look at a diode, right? we've looked at diodes as in the review, uh, the cathode is the negative side and the anode is the positive side of the diode. Well, remember that the current positive charge flow typically flows the other way through, um, through a diode. So. So that's some, sometimes a confusing point to uh, people in class when I talk about diodes and the anode being the positive side when students have studied batteries first. Okay, so um, let's talk about common specifications for battery. First is the chemistry. Uh, the chemistry describes the materials of the anode, the materials of the cathode, and, and the dielectric. And an example is the AA battery. Um, zinc manganese dioxide is really what a, an alkaline battery is, typical alkaline battery. Okay, so you can, you know, you've heard of LiPo lithium polymer batteries and um, different types of batteries. That's describing the chemistry of the battery, and they have different capabilities and uh, based on that chemistry, different voltages, different capacities. Okay, and so then another specification is, is the battery a primary battery or is the battery a secondary battery? A primary battery is a one-time use battery. So the batteries that you throw out when you're done with them, those are primary batteries. A secondary battery is a rechargeable battery. So the battery in your car is is a rechargeable battery. Okay, we often care about battery voltage. So uh, there are multiple voltages for a battery. So I say 1.5 volt battery for this AA cell, but there are different voltages for that cell. So there's open circuit voltage, right? That's right out of 
a, a Thevenin and equivalent lesson. That means don't connect anything to the battery, in this case, when it's full charged, and there's an open circuit voltage uh, across that battery. So, so the open circuit voltage is the voltage with no load applied, and it does vary with charge state. If, if you have a brand new AA battery, it's about 1.6 volts or 1.57, somewhere in there. But this is a, this is a common, this is the voltage of a, a new AA battery. Um, but then there's something called a terminal voltage or, or, or closed circuit voltage, and that's voltage with a specific load applied. So if you look at some battery data sheets, you'll see, well, the, the terminal voltage is this, or the closed circuit voltage of this is this when you're, when you're drawing a certain amount of current or when you're delivering a certain amount of power from the battery. That's, that would be specified along with that voltage. And then there's the nominal voltage, which we often just, you know, that's, that's what we commonly use for a AA battery, 1.5 volts, a car battery, lead acid, 12 volts, right? That's, that's the nominal voltage. Um, and, and the voltage is going to vary based on charge state. Well, the nominal voltage is just going to be given, but you know, the, the, the actual voltage between the terminals across the terminals varies with charge state. And then, so when is a battery empty? That's the cutoff voltage. So you'll see cutoff voltage listed in discharge profiles on data sheets for batteries. So when it says cutoff voltage, that means the voltage of a discharge battery or the empty state. And sometimes they give multiple cutoff voltages, um, you know, depending upon the current you're expecting you're gonna draw or that is specified for uh, um, a certain battery at a certain charge state. And we'll take a look at some examples of data sheet tables. And then there's capacity. So this is basically how long your battery is going to last, um, how much it holds. And so amp hours is a, is a common capacity specification. So you'll see on this battery label, it says, 12 amp hours, and that's specified for a specific discharge rate. There's also watt hours. So watt hours, right? That's that's um, uh, how much, how many hours can you operate at a specific watt delivery, power delivery from from a battery? So those are two ways to specify. Uh, capacity for a battery. I often see amp hours. Amp hours is pretty common. Okay, and then there are general classifications for batteries like high energy versus high power. So high energy means there's a lot of energy storage. You can operate at reasonably low current for a long time versus high power. I just need like to start a car. I need, I need lots of power delivered to turn over the engine uh, for short periods of time. And uh, so those are general classifications of batteries. And then there's deep cycles. So if you're operating a marine battery that's meant to operate an electric motor that moves a small boat forward, um, if you're operating a, a, you know, what else is there? Uh, deep cycle battery just for, op for, for um, portable energy. If you're going off grid for in your, in your RV or in your, you know, motorhome trailer, um, you can, you can, you can bring these batteries to a lower charge state without damaging them when they're deep cycle. Okay, then there's discharge rate and discharge rate is often associated with capacity. So there's this C rate, um, it's actually a current rate. So that's the discharge current express as, expressed as a factor of the battery amp hour capacity. Okay, so for a 12 amp hour battery, many times it depends on the, like look at the type of battery and look at the manufacturer's data sheet, but you'll see uh, this is 12 amp hours at C over 10, which means 12 divided by 10, 1.2 amps discharge rate. So you'll get, you'll get, uh, uh, you know, th that capacity at this discharge rate. And then there's E rate. This is discharge power expressed as a factor uh, of the watt hour capacity. So for 150 watt hour battery, um, you know, E over two would be 75 watts. Okay, so if you if you uh, discharge this battery at uh, 
75 watts, you'll have 150 watt hours of capacity. Again, I often see the C rate used for the batteries that I use. All right, so let's relate this information, battery information, to battery specifications affecting mechanical design. So, right, you you care about when you're designing something that you have a you have a certain size and you have a certain weight budget. So we care about well size and weight often. So specific energy in units of watt hours per kilogram. So watt hour is a an energy unit kilograms, a mass unit, weight unit. So this describes the weight of a battery based on its energy capacity. So you can, you can, you can compare um, different, like if you have a, two different batteries of the same capacity and you, you can compare their weights, their specific power. So this describes the weight of a battery based on its power capability in watts per kilogram. So watts, that's power, kilograms, mass or weight. And there's energy density. So here's, uh, instead of energy per weight, this is energy per volume. So this describes the volume of a battery based on energy capacity. And so there's also power density, which is the volume of a battery based on power capability. Okay, so all of these affect mechanical design and selecting batteries. So, so this was an interesting plot that I, I grabbed off this reference here. Um, the plot shows different types of batteries, different chemistries, uh, and, and where they fall on this axis that is, well, horizontal axis is um, energy density, right? Vertical axis is specific energy, okay? So if you look at the energy density axis, as you go to the right, uh, battery gets smaller for a given need. If you look at the vertical axis, as you go up, the battery gets lighter. Okay, so this, this lets you compare, uh, for example, a lead acid battery, like in your car, to a lithium ion battery, different types of those, um, which, are, which are smaller and lighter. It shows where those families roughly fall. You know, and you say, well, wait a minute, you know, why don't, why don't I, why would I want a heavy, big battery, like a lead acid battery? Why don't I always go with these, uh, the lithium family of batteries? Well, that's, the answer is higher cost. So as you go um, lighter and smaller, cost increases, and that's a factor in engineering decisions. So down here in the lower left, these uh, batteries like lead acid batteries are, are better for starting cars, right? They, they can provide high current. Your car can handle a lot of weight. The volume of the battery fits in your car. Uh, um, so, so they're reason and they're reasonably cheap. So they're, they're good for automotive applications. But if you need lighter and smaller, like you have a drone application that has a limited payload and limited space, then you're going to move to these uh, to these batteries. Also, you probably want re um, you know rechargeable for the drones, just like you want for the car. But you need a light, small, rechargeable, high density, high energy density battery, and so that costs more. Okay, so this is kind of a, a map of when you're choosing batteries, what, what you have to think about for the um, mechanical design considerations. All right, so let's talk about some common primary battery, like primaries non-rechargeable, common primary battery types uh, and chemistry. So the good old alkaline AA battery. So this is the zinc manganese dioxide battery. That's what you're getting when you're getting an alkaline double A. Uh, we know these as 1.5 volt batteries. And when we have an open circuit voltage of 1.6, we know the battery is fully charged and, and new. So it's easy to tell when a double A battery is new, the voltage is going to be um, 1.6 volts, well, high 1.5s. The cutoff voltage is the voltage that you would drain the battery to typically, and that's what the data sheets specify. Like this is the lowest voltage 
where, where they where they specify um, uh, you know characteristics of the battery on plots. So the cutoff voltage is somewhere between 0.8 and 1.2, and sometimes that well that often depends on your circuit and how low the voltage can go before the battery is not usable. And we'll relate that that to your project and your DC to DC converter. So the um, open circuit voltage. Uh, when you have less than 20% remaining is is 1.1 volts. So this is how you know your battery is almost dead, right? You have less than 20% capacity when you get to that open circuit voltage. In terms of amp hours, and this is milliamp hours, these batteries, depending upon the kind of battery, um, depending upon the, the brand and what they're doing specifically with the chemistry and construction, uh, the capacity is uh, 1,500 to 2,500 milliamp hours. Okay, or 1.5 to 2.5 amp hours. Okay, the 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 uh, you look at data sheets and the maximum performance of this battery is is listed as when you have uh, a one amp current from the battery. And so these are ubiquitous, right? They're they're all over the place because they're small, they're cheap, they're real, um, you know they're they're uh, they they're useful for the voltages that we typically need for for circuits, right? You can you can put these, you can use them alone for 1.5 volt sources, and you can put them in series to get like you're doing in lab uh, six volt sources. And then there are variants like the AAA, the C, and the D. They have uh, similar construction, they're different sizes, and that affects the the capacity of the battery. So the bigger batteries will have higher capacity, and um, current capability. So the bigger batteries typically have a higher current capability. Okay, and then, um, you know, in the last, I don't know, many, many, or a couple decades, all right, you've seen uh, lithium AA batteries come out. And um, lithium batteries are called that because they have a lithium anode, but there are various cathode and electrolyte materials in chemistry. So this battery that was meant to be a higher energy replacement for the AA battery is uh, lithium iron disulfide. So it was really meant to be 1.5 volts nominal, um, but you'll see that the open circuit voltage is 1.8 volts, and it just barely fits within the specification of a 1.5 volt battery. So because right, um, alkaline 1.5 volt AA batteries have 1.6 volts open circuit voltage. These have 1.8 volts. So you're going, your circuit has to tolerate the the higher voltage. Okay, but and these uh, the the materials of this battery were actually tweaked to take a lithium battery and get it down from three volts. I'll show you, which is typical, down to this 1.8 volts. Uh, and uh, but but it makes it usable within the specification of this 1.5 volt battery. The open circuit voltage, when you have more than about 1.74 volts, that's a good battery. Less than 1.70 volts, that's a bad battery. These voltages depend, they're, they're, they vary, but it's it's harder to tell when you have a close to dead lithium battery because because usually at the end, their their performance falls like a rock. So you gotta be ready to replace. Uh, they, they, work, they work hard until the end. The cutoff voltage in the plots that I'll show you is about uh, 0.9 volts, and their capacity is higher, uh, about 3,200 to 3,500 milliamp hours. That's why these batteries are more expensive, because they have higher capacity. Okay, so compare uh, 3,200 to 3,500 to 1,500 to 2,500. And we'll talk about the cost and the comparison dollars per milliamp hour. So the max continuous current is higher than uh, an alkaline battery, 2.5 amps. And so these are meant for higher power applications and where you need higher capacity compared to the alkaline chemistry. All right. And so those are two common batteries. And then there's the battery that you have in your key fob or garage door opener or other small electronic device. This is uh, the, uh, often called the lithium coin cell. This is a CR2032. There are variants based on the, the thickness and the diameter of, um, of the coin cell. This is a lithium manganese dioxide uh, battery. 
and nominally it's three volts. It's a three volt battery, right? So they had to tweak the, the chemistry of that battery to get it to operate as a, a lithium battery to operate it um, within the specs of a 1.5 volt battery range. So uh, open circuit voltage is 3.2 to 3.3 volts. Uh, cutoff is around two volts. And the capacity is 240 milliamp hours, which, which seems pretty small. Well, that's because the volume of this battery is really small compared to those AA batteries. So it's, it's still um, high energy density. Right. And so they're meant for low current applications typically. So they last, you know, low, low uh, high energy density, um, uh, small and typically low, low current drain from these. Okay. So those are three common primary battery types and there, there are variants of these. Okay. And so, you know, uh, you'll see these cutoff voltages. And so, you know, when is a battery really dead? Uh, I like to answer when your circuit stops working, right? So in lab, you have a DC to DC converter that converts that six volt battery packs voltage to 1.5 volts. And, and we'll talk about the limits on that, but, but you, you can calculate, you can use these um, specifications, data sheets that we're gonna talk about to estimate, but in the end, you wind up testing because really for your project, your, your battery is dead when your prop cannot turn 2,700 RPM, right? So you'll, you'll, uh, you'll experience that if you leave your battery pack on uh, overnight. Okay, some, some other common, uh, another common battery type, nine volt batteries. So these, these are interesting batteries because uh, they're actually six 1.5 volt cells connected in series. So here's one construction. You see these layers of cells, right? You have six cells there stacked up. You can see how the electrodes connect to the top and the bottom of this battery. So if you were to pull one apart, this is what you'd see. Um, another type of construction of nine volt batteries are six quadruple A cells right, wrapped up in this package. Okay, so various ways you can construct these batteries, but but this is a you know a, a uh, the the double A um, either lithium or alkaline and the coin cell. Those are single cell batteries. This is a multi cell battery, six cells that are 1.5 volts. Okay, and you can check out these references to get uh, if you want to dig into these images more. All right, so um, so let's suppose you're you're designing something. You're designing, I don't know, right, a, a sensor to go on a, a drone, a sensor to go on a high altitude balloon, and you want to know if a battery is going to work. You think, well, I'll just grab some Energizer double A's, Duracell double A's, whatever, and you'll um, put them in your device and you'll get, you know, stack them up in series. You'll have six volts with four batteries and you'll launch the balloon and everything will be okay. Well, it's worth taking time to look at these specifications on the data sheets. You're not going to find the data sheets on the back of the packages at your local, uh, local grocery store. But if you go um, to the website of the manufacturer, you'll find these, these data sheets and data tables. So battery data sheets typically include the chemistry and the electrical specification summaries and, and plots that we'll take a look at, right? So you can see this is an alkaline battery. Um, here's the nominal voltage. Here's the nominal internal resistance, internal resistance. So think of that as the Thevenin uh, resistance of the battery when you consider it as a non-ideal or practical voltage source. Right, so batteries are not ideal independent voltage sources. Um, they have to be modeled as a, uh, they can be modeled as a Thevenin equivalent with this internal resistance. So uh, battery specifications impact the mechanical design. And, you know, so when you're a mechanical engineer, you think, okay, I, I know the voltage, but you've got to look at, 
the environments and and the um, and the size. So weight, volume, operating temperature, and materials are typically specified. So if you're uh, you know if you're going to launch a high altitude balloon, well, it might get colder than minus 18 C or, or zero F, right? So this battery might need, um, might need uh, some kind of a heater, which is gonna use energy in itself to, to keep it operating up at high altitudes for any duration, or, or it might need to be insulated so that it doesn't uh, lose heat to the environment um, for the time that it's going to be up at altitude. So you get weight and you get, you know, if the materials matter, like here's a plastic label. So, you know, maybe, maybe you're putting it to some environment where the, um, where the, uh, the battery might be exposed to, you know, some kind of chemical or fuel. So you want to know. And some characteristics like those we talked about, like energy and power densities, right, might not be stated, but they can be derived from this information so that you can compare battery chemistries and battery manufacturers side by side. If you need a very high energy density battery, then you can, you can start digging into these specifications and calculate your, uh, the, the derived requirements that you, uh, that you need. So let's talk about um, battery capacity. So here's that, here's that double A again. So here's a plot out of the data sheet. This is milliamp hour capacity, all right? And it's a, it, it's a capacity down to 0.8 volts at 21C. So 0.8 volts is the cutoff voltage. And this plot shows the capacity in milliamp hours on the vertical axis, horizontal, we have uh, a discharge rate, 25 milliamps, 100 milliamps, 250 milliamps, half an amp. Okay, so let's look at how, how we might use this to estimate, you know, if you're trying to estimate how long is your motor going to, to run before you have to change batteries in lab, you could use an analysis like this. So let's suppose an electrical device requires a current from a AA battery uh, between 0.1 amps and a half an amp, depending upon the mode of operation, right? Because loads change. So when you're talking on your phone and the, your phone is transmitting, it's consuming higher power from the battery than when it's in standby. So there's, there's a range here. So what is the uh, ex expected life of, of this battery, of this single cell battery? Well, uh, at... 100 milliamps discharge rate, right? you have a capacity of 2,500 milliamp hours. So I would expect just from this data that it would take 25 hours to discharge that battery down to 0.8 volts. Okay. So that's at the, at the lower current. What if you step up the current, your load draws more current. Uh, then you look at the plot and for 500 milliamps, then you have about what, 1400 milliamp hours as shown on this plot. So 1400 milliamp hours divided by 500 milliamps is 2.8 hours. Right? So, I mean, this, this is what you would expect if you're, if you're consuming more current from the battery, consuming drawing more current from the battery, then you'd expect it to not last as long. Um, but notice it's not linear, you know, that, that, a single milliamp hour rating capability for a battery is, is not good enough because notice here that increasing the discharge current by a factor of five actually reduced the service time by a factor of nine. So that was a nonlinear relationship there. So a, a takeaway is that capacity depends on discharge current. So you can't just look at a, uh, a, a single value, right? A single specification. Oh, look at, you know, go to Amazon. You see a battery. It says 2,500 milliamp hours. I'm good. I'm going to draw an amp for, you know, whatever, um, 2.5 hours. So don't rely on a single capacity value. If you're out in the woods and you're depending on your battery to get you through the night on your heater, right? <laughs> You've got to do some uh, dig, uh, deeper digging. 
And also the specified capacity relies on the ability of, of your load of your device that you're operating to operate down to a voltage of V cutoff, right? So in this example, uh, your, your device has to be able to operate off of 0.81 volts, right down, down to 0.8. And um, if not, if your device doesn't work that low, then well, that's not the life. So what I usually do is I, I start preliminary designs uh, using manufacturer data, and then I confirm with test and measurement. So when you have either your device or something with which you can emulate your device, your load, then test it with the battery, see how it, see how that matches the, the data. And um, once you have that kind of comparison of what the battery can actually do compared to what its data sheet says, then you have some factor by which, with which you can apply and get a better estimate based on specs for your device. All right. Okay, so let's talk about um, battery capacity versus power supplied. So um, some devices use approximately constant power. Like if you, if you have a, you know, your motor in lab, if that motor is turning a, a constant mechanical load, right, then, then you're delivering uh, constant power to that motor to get that load to, to turn, that mechanical load to turn. Um, and so if you're delivering a constant power, then current will increase as the battery discharges and voltage falls right here. So if I'm P equals IV, so if I have constant power and voltage falls because the battery is going dead, then current has to increase. So you can relate service life to power in, uh, instead of um, a current. Right? So relate service life to power instead of current because you know you need a constant power draw from the battery and current is going to change. So there are plots in data sheets that, that show you this. This is constant power performance, right? Constant discharge here down you know, on the horizontal axis in milliwatts. Um, and this is again, under certain conditions like 21C temperature. And you have um, uh, service hours here. So the life of the battery down to two different cutoff voltages here. And don't forget that some devices require a minimum supply voltage to operate. So like your DC to DC converter in, in lab operates down to 3.2 volts or somewhere around there. Okay, so that, that matters. Okay, so for these devices, when you know a certain minimum voltage, you use the family of curves that relate um, service to voltage and, and power. So this is an example plot here. So here we have service hours on the horizontal axis, on the vertical axis, um, closed circuit voltage, okay, while the battery is delivering power. Okay, so you can see here, well, you know, look back at the, at the, the left plot here, the constant power performance, right, we have uh, service hours based on how low you're going to discharge the battery in volts. And, and over here we have service hours while you're trying to deliver a constant power, right? So 100 milliwatts up top, 250 milliwatts below that. So the battery lasts longer when you are consuming less power from the battery, that makes sense. Okay, and so the this is a very nonlinear plot, and it's not very high resolution on the power. So if you have to uh, uh, estimate in between 100 milliwatts and 250 milliwatts, then you kind of have to draw your own curve. Again, that's just an estimate, and then you would test. So performance depends on battery age. If the battery is really old; it might not meet the spec. Uh, temperature. And, and load duty cycle, right? Depending if you have the battery operating at a high load from start until it's dead or you operate it intermittently. 
And so again, start with the manufacturer data for your design and then measure and test before you've committed to a battery. It's always easier to change a design early in the design cycle compared to later in the design cycle. All right, so let's let's do an example. Um, let's do a battery life calculation example. So let's suppose you have a battery and then a motor driver circuit and then a motor. Okay, this should look familiar. So you have a AA battery and it powers a DC motor using this driver circuit in a 21C 70 degrees F environment. And that DC motor spins a constant mechanical load okay, in terms of delivering power. And let's say the DC motor with the driver circuit requires 200 milliwatts to spin the mechanical load. So what I'm saying is 200 milliwatts actually has to go into the driver circuit. Of course, that has some loss. It's not 100% efficient. So a little less than 200 milliwatts gets delivered to the motor. But let's say we know we want to deliver 200 milliwatts to the motor driver circuit from that battery. And then as the battery discharges, the battery voltage falls and the supplied current increases. Right, but that again, back to you want a constant power, and if voltage falls, current has to increase in order to maintain constant power. And let's say that this driver circuit requires a minimum of 1.2 volts at its input to operate. So 1.2 volts minimum at its input here. And the question we all want to answer is, how long will this motor operate? All right, so you bring up the plot. Here's the constant power performance plot at 21C. Um, and uh, we're, we're, we're looking at the 200 milliwatt level of power draw from the battery. And so you go and you look, we want to look at 1.2 volts minimum because that's the minimum voltage that the motor driver circuit will accept at its input. And go over here on this log scale plot and you get six hours. Okay, so that's just an example of how to read these plots. So um, based on this specification, the battery's data sheet, uh, its constant power performance plot shows that the motor will operate for six hours before the battery voltage falls to 1.2 volts and the motor driver stops working. Okay. So this should give you an idea of what, what we've talked about, the, the battery capacity, how you have milliamp hours um, that specify uh, the, the, the charge stored in the battery and its capacity, and how you, you can't trust one number if you really want to, if you're just comparing battery chemistries and you want to know, should I use a, a lithium AA battery or an alkaline AA battery and, you, you know, Maybe an alkaline does it, it's cheaper, it does the job so you can use it. And, and you might base some initial calculations, some preliminary design calculations off of just the single numbers. But if you're really going to estimate life of a battery analytically, then you have to dig into some of these plots that are in the data sheets. And then even when you do that in the end, I'd recommend testing to make sure that your device can operate as long as you think it. It can, but it's good for comparison, for comparing battery technologies, battery chemistries, battery manufacturers, um, to, to start off with the single numbers, then move to the plots, and then move to testing. So all this data is useful. Okay, so uh, it looks like I'm about to hit the wall on time here. So let's see, in closing, uh, check Canvas for the due dates and the due times. So all those assignments are posted. Uh, you've, uh, you'll, you'll see the uh, homework due dates and times and the lab due dates and due times. So check those out. Homework three is due Wednesday, uh, the 25th. And uh, the exam will be issued at Friday on Friday at noon. It will be due Monday at noon. And so I'll send an announcement out about that. 
And I'm going to hold office hours right after class. So if you'd like to join office hours to chat about anything, homework, in class, out of class, um, or just listen in to what we're talking about, uh, go ahead and join. Just stay on this session. Um, if you don't join, I'll see you next time. Have a great night.